new for the group you've chosen and take part in a more intensive discussion group or what I have possibly wrongfully termed an informal workshop. Who knows? Importantly, we ask everyone here today not only to listen and learn, but also to share ideas, query current and historical thinking, voice opinions, and educate our speakers as well. So, on that note, please join me in welcoming our first group. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Delia North. I'm from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. I'm a, a professor in statistics, and I'm very privileged indeed to have this opportunity to pitch to you what we're doing in education, in mathematics education, but that includes statistics education. So it's in mathematics and statistics education. I'm the um, focus area leader for mathematics education, which once again includes statistics education. And with me is um, our second speaker, who you can see in the middle here, and also sitting at the end, Dr. Nambuso Zondo, who is a graduate of University of Natal Durban and did a PhD and of course majors in statistics, but also majored in mathematics. Sorry, can I just go back? How did that go away? Um, so Nambusa and I lead the focus area uh, mathematics education for COE Maths. And the third speaker in the session to follow is Renette, uh, Professor Renette Blichnert from University Western Cape, who's the head of statistics and plays a very big role in statistics education at all levels, in particular linking statistics departments to industry with their data science. In the same way, University of KwaZulu-Natal, where I am in the statistics sector for many, many years and where Nambusa is, we do a lot to grow statistics at all levels through education at university, but in particular linking our students to industry and then at the lower end, what can we do at school to link the school children to know about statistics and about opportunities? Because I don't think you know, most probably, that out of all learners that finish grade 12, I'm on Umalusi, and I know that the learners that finish grade 12, almost 50% of them will be unemployed. I don't sit comfortably with that. So what can I do as an educator at the top end to ensure not only that school leavers know about statistics and about mathematics and take mathematics seriously because mathematics is at the kernel of all our sciences. But after all, it's about opportunities to create employment. So that really is our driver. So I am here to pitch what uh, we do at our institutions, but also at the COE Mass in particular, to try and ensure that so many school leavers that finish grade 12 do not end up unemployed. And amongst graduates, do you know that 32% of graduates that have a degree end up unemployed? It's just not good enough. So what can we do through the maths, uh, maths and statistics education, and now including computer science topics, as you will see shortly. And I want you to come and join our session afterwards. So this really is just a pitch to say, please come and be part of the discussion, where the three of us will lead the discussion. Because you come from a unique trajectory. What brought you to this point? Despite maybe many, many obstacles, and many people that maybe wanted to do what you did but weren't successful, what brought you here? And what can you do to be an example and to, to, to be a beacon of hope for others? Because really, that's what it's about, isn't it? Right. So um, the, the, today is about the role of analytics and AI and machine learning in sec secondary and tertiary education. That's the topic we've been given that the three of us will be talking to. It's the data age. I don't have to say much more. After all, mathematics education research 
must include learners knowing about opportunities for them in the, in the long run. Where are they hoping to be employed? That, do they know that they must take mathematics extremely seriously at school? Because if you don't, you can never go into science education, any, any science. You can't go into any commerce, no STEM, no engineering, if you don't take school, stat, stat, uh, sorry, school mathematics very seriously. So we do a lot of advocation through the COE mass funding because that's important. We don't only work with learners. We need to work with teachers because the, you must probably know um, the formal definition of maths education is the following. Practice of teaching and learning um, and carrying out scholarly research into transfer of mathematical knowledge. That's the formal definition. I got it from ChatGPT. But it's more than that. It's skills for orientation in the data-driven world. It's much more than that. So we need to do it in a, in a meaningful way. At school, we teach um, the children you know, algebra, ma geometry, mathematics, which is the kernel of mathematics. And of course, they should know that and they should know well what, what, what those topics are. But it's also important that they data literate, that they have basic statistical thinking and that they can they understand probability and risk. I wrote the school curriculum for Department of Education and about, uh, with Linda Chisholm in about 2002 around there when outcome-based education came in because suddenly everybody said statistics should be at the school level as well, right? All around the world. Well, we're not geniuses that figured it out here in South Africa. When we face a challenge, you can be sure it was recognized long ago, in Europe, in Australia, in America. So what did they do? That's what I do. I check what other people did in other countries, not just sitting in my office alone. I go to the American Stats Association, to the International Stats Institute. How are they solving? I'm part of that conversation. We get onto those committees and we see what they did. And then we don't copy because Africa is different. Africans can change. What is already working, what's already been identified as being a good solution internationally, and then we adapt it to our country, which we've done for many, many years successfully. So we are um, part of the part of the um, brief I was given is to uh, to be able to speak to all of you and to say. Let us have a conversation in how we can do these things better. Yes, algebra, geometry, calculus, that's important. But also data literacy, statistical thinking, probability and risk. Is it so easy we can just say, oh, teachers, read it up, you can do it after all? No, it's not like that. Because it will be done in the wrong way. It will not be done that will inherently make it their own. So we are part of international, international studies, international conversations, and then we bring it home to South Africa, and that's very important. But in the same way, data age is much further now. So though we've got statistics content in the curriculum, we also need to advocate for programming, for informatics, for machine learning and AI. Those things are extremely important. So how can we retain the excellence in teaching mathematics? But at the same time, we need to be able to, to encourage learners to be learning in a way that will not mean that they have to be totally retaught if they want a job. So how can we bring in the excellence of mathematics, the excellence of statistics, the excellence of computer science to grow the disciplines in a realistic way in the data era? And that's really what our conversation is about. And we would like you to be part of that. This is just a pitch. To be part of that conversation in the long run, so that in the, in the next session, so that we can all be sure that we are doing the responsible thing of ensuring that our learners leave school knowing how great mathematics is, how great statistics is, how, how great computer science topics are in those syllabi. So what is good teaching? And I started thinking when I was preparing these few slides, okay, I've only got three slides. The most important thing, what is good teaching? Fit for purpose and well delivered. So fit for purpose means for the current age. Don't just teach and say, well, somebody will reteach that. 
you know, so that you can get a job. No, it's not good enough. So the growth of the, of the economy is inhibited. If research does not include modernizing the teaching of mathematics and statistics in the general sense by including these new topics, because that grows the discipline in line with the modern era and pr prepares the youth for both a working world and a career in academia. Because we're not just about let's be great at university. We want our students from school to know where the jobs are, what must I put my energy into, and then at university to teach responsibly and to work with the world of work so that we can get learners that come through because after all, the world of work will give us new opportunities in mathematics and statistics education as well, and we do attempt to do that. So we want to know what are your experiences and how best can we do this to improve the feed, the feed through from school to university to world of work, which, by the way, has a lot of research opportunities as well. So mathematics education research focus is to increase the flow of suitably trained, lifelong learners. If you finished university 10 years ago, it's very different, the world, to what it is today. So we need lifelong learners. And how can we do that? We can do that by working with teachers, by working with educators, and not just sitting here trying to do it, Work with the best internationally. Get onto those international education committees. That's what we do. And we're continuously updating. So we want to hear from you. You've got a unique path. You can help us and you can give new perspectives. We look forward to seeing you. Okay, let me first. Yeah, but help. Proud. It's just a good one. Is this? Where's the slides? Okay, let me start as well. I think we can't. We must applaud Delia for this excellent. She's a teacher, a preacher. So um, from my side, I'm Andreet Becker. With me, I have this gentleman, Johan. He is a professor in statistics at the University of Pretoria. I'm also from the University of Pretoria. I'm also a professor there. And uh, together, we are the focus areas, what do you say, coordinators for statistics and applied statistics. And um, that is a tall order for something that I don't think I must say it. Or must I say it? Because there are about 11 or how many other focus areas in maths, but we only have one in statistics. But things are going to change. I hope so. Where's Bruce? Bruce? Things are going to change, huh, Bruce? <laughs> Kirsten, is it, is it like? Is it, okay. Um, so I'm just here to start the conversation, and um, Johan is uh, going to do the job because he is young and people like him, you know. So uh, can you just have the first, the first slide, please? Okay, I can do it quickly. Okay, so sorry to say, Diane, but you say we are statistics workers. So, um, that was very hard, <laughs> very, very hard. Do you agree with me, Dina? Very, very hard. Because that is exactly what people think we are. Because they think, okay, you just are dealing with numbers. That's all. And also, again, the, the worst is dashboards. Dashboards, okay, so it is just a nice form of um, visual statistics. Or they think we are, as Johan says, what is it? We are the mechanic, or what do you say it? We are the mechanic of everyone. Mm -mm. We are not that. 
all they see us, we lie. That's how we see, they perceive us in the world, and specific also in South Africa. And also among some of our very close colleagues. They think we are those type of people. No, we are not. And I've heard many times today, data science. Where's Professor Luisa? Data. So what are we really doing? We are part of a big machinery. And we are a very, very crucial element of this data generation. Or data age, or what do you call it, Delia? Digital world. We are important. But people don't see us like that. Now, I ask many times today for Delia, is it, who's, where is this miscommunication? What happened? Because they will say easily data science, but did I ever hear statistics? Not so many times. So that it is the message, is what is perceived outside and what is actually happening are mutually exclusive. Totally exclusive. So what can we do? We have to bring that together. And I don't know how many of you are statistical orientated or let us call it machine learning. What do you say? Then they like us more. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then they like us more. So we ask you, what can we do to make us more visible or more aware that statistics and as Professor Nolf says, and, and, and um, that is, you cannot just do dashboards. There's a probabilistic thinking that is essential in this whole data world. And now I leave it to my handsome colleague, Johan. That is the first time she's called me handsome. <laughs> but I prefer the adjective humble. <laughs> my name is Johan. I am very happy to be here. I am fortunate to have recently also supervised the master student at Ames, so it's my second time here. And I am uh, really grateful for my colleagues. Colleagues in the sense, of course, is a little bit wider than just statistics. Um, I think all of us, one way or the other, suffer from the similar type of general industrial imposter syndrome when we're in the analytical sciences. And I have, I have one or two things I just want to, uh, I just want to pitch. And then if you have thoughts and ideas, if you have an opinion, then we can maybe talk a little bit more about it afterwards. I know it looks like there's a lot of slides. Uh, the intention is for me to just uh, annoy you enough that you can tell me what you think afterwards. That's really the, that's really the goal, I think. Um, I'd say these are my perspectives. That's a disclaimer. Um, I did not put my name on them on the slide. So if this gets circulated, then I can claim that it was never me, um, whatever I end up saying. So I have plausible deniability. Um, we were asked to, to have a little bit of a think about, you know, how, how is statistics perceived in the South African landscape? And I have just some two or three things. I'm going to say it out loud and then if you have an opinion about this, even if it comes from a mathematics uh, background, I'll, I'll be happy to hear some of it. I call it philosophical perceptions of statistics because at the end of the day, before I'm a statistician, I'd like to think myself of myself as a philosopher, trying to think about how stuff makes sense, whether it's statistics specific or mathematics specific or algebra specific. I like to think about things, and I like to think that that is what a philosopher really is. My first word I want to toy with is what does emerging mean? Emerging not in the sense of a researcher, emerging as a sense of, in the sense of a research trend. What does emerging mean? I want to toy with the idea, uh, is emerging recent? Is that what it means? Or uh, is emerging continuously evolving? I like to think of something like uh, the bootstrap when it comes to, to statistics. The bootstrap is definitely not recent, but it's still emerging. 
in the past 30, 40 years, variants, ideas, thoughts, discussions, the philosophy behind how we deal with data. Um, reading, I feel, is very important, something that we don't do often. In statistics, we often like to, to grab something like an R squared by the time we want to fit something. But there are so much proof in the literature that an R squared actually really tells us nothing. So using the R squared is something that we should be reflecting on as does that make sense in the broader uh, statistical world as, a, as a, such an important component that we often teach and use. And then I actually want to talk most importantly about what does perception mean? How do we experience ourselves? How do we experience our colleagues? How do we experience that? that we literally do every single day. Uh, in my case, statistics. Is statistics a service discipline? Uh, something that I'm quite passionate about. Uh, my passion comes from, uh, it's not a service discipline, by the way. I'm just posing the question, is it a service discipline? Um, statistics with no identity, that's a concern for me. We live in what I like to call the data science dilution of our era. We tend to lose a sense of our identity, of our what we think we are, what are we supposed to do, how must we think about things. And then, just as an example, there's a very fancy journal, Journal of Data Science, but as soon as I start reading all of the papers that were featured here, yo, it looks like stats to me. Uh, and I'm not saying I have a problem with the data science component, I'm saying I want to reflect and I want to dream about what does, what does the perception of stats mean in this case, when it comes to what I like to call the data science dilution. Are the following emerging? Some questions. Estimating the reciprocal of a binomial proportion published in a definitely very fancy journal, 2023. But this is something that arguably some people would consider, but this is not emerging. But it's published in a good journal. It's a simple idea. It published in 2023. To me, maybe it's emerging of sorts. I don't know. What do you think? Statistical methods in medical research. Impact factor. For stats, this is high. I know some of you might feel like, oh, it's not that high. For me, 3.2 is high. Uh, something about uh, uh, cluster variation modeling. Is this emerging? Don't know. I think so. What do you think? Uh, are these perceived in a generic sense? How are we perceived in, South, in the South African landscape? Once again, I'm talking from a statistical point of view. The South African Statistical Journal published 12 papers during 2022 and 2023 over four issues. 12 papers, okay? And I think this comes from an institutional push, at least from my point of view, maybe elsewhere as well. We need to publish in high impact factor journals. We need to publish in multidisciplinary aspects. There's a bunch of motivations for that. So how do we think about how statistics is perceived if the South African Statistics Journal maybe does not elicit enough submissions or does not continue to bolster the environment in the statistical sense. My question is then, does it matter? Where do we draw the line? How do we perceive all of this? And then some questions. Who is responsible for the progress? Is it me? Is it you? Who is responsible? I, I have an answer to that or a, an opinion. I'm not going to sell you. Come ask me. <laughs> and then does or will statistics operate on an intellectual island? Is statistics supposed to be so separate? Are we supposed to be so incredibly defensive when it comes to our discipline? Are we scared of the dilution? Should we embrace it? What is this, where does this leave us by the time we get measured? If I want to be promoted, if I want to apply for a new job, if I want to apply for a grant, where does this leave me? And then uh, I put this purposefully on the red block. Is the South African landscape its own worst enemy? Let's talk about it. Page. This is the last page, so maybe we go to the first one. Okay, 
when they try to change the slides, uh, I would like actually to. Oh, ah, so sorry to interrupt me. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, my talk or my presentation is slightly probably different. Uh, there's a lot of uh, division between pure and applied mathematics, uh, especially in South Africa and in mostly all, all countries coming from British heritage. And uh, the gap is very big. We prompted famous mathematician Halmos to say that there, is, there are only two types of mathematics. This is bad and good mathematics, and applied mathematics in British sense belongs to the bad mathematics usually. <laughs> and in fact, uh, what is abomination for me also is that, uh, you know, uh, quite prominent applied mathematicians working in South Africa say that in applied mathematics you don't do proofs, which for me is abomination. Anyway, uh, I would like actually to talk about uh, interplay of pure and applied mathematics. And uh, let us start with the following question. Is it pure and or applied art? Is David creation of Adam? Well, definitely you would say that it's pure, fine art. But it was commissioned by the Pope to enhance the power of the church and currently pulls income of over 80 million euros per year to the Vatican City. So it is pure and applied, OK? One of the most beautiful results in linear algebra is Peron Frobenius theorem, which tells us about the existence of strictly positive eigenvector of positive matrix, matrix positive elements. Pure or apply? Actually, this is the basis of the Google PageRank algorithm, which is worth about, I mean, I don't remember how many zeros, but it's actually a lot of zeros here. So it's pure or applied mathematics. Okay, and if we go back to history and to geography of mathematics, of develop, development of mathematics, then in most cases, mathematics was developed to answer concrete questions concerning outside world, starting from Babylon, where actually it was accounting, uh, going through uh, Archimedes, going to Chinese, or, for example, Maya mathematics was developed to exactly calculate the end of the world, which is an applied question in some sense, yes? And so on. So actually, there is a lot of mathematics created by essentially trying to answer some concrete questions. So uh, I will present you an like, enhanced picture of the development of sciences, which in some sense is up to me. So, Starting with the quote from Shastri, published in, in uh, AMS notices, we are of this world and nothing comes entirely from within ourselves without reference to the external world. So in my opinion, everything starts somewhere in nature, society, or engineering, and we create a model, let us say mathematical model. And there are essentially two ways of continuing from here. If we... No, I am, no, I am, I am alive. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, 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 okay, no, I, I still can move, okay? You're for that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> sorry for this. <laughs> okay, okay, so. Uh, I think it's still more or less probably visible. <laughs> so uh, we, we create, yeah, I have to, I have to be careful. <laughs> okay, thanks. It's good to bring some entertainment to the public. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, just just continuing, uh, depending depending, <laughs> okay, <laughs> depending on our attitude to life, when we create a model, we just can go into computation, data comparison, revision, and essentially move in this cycle. But if we are mathematicians, then we try to analyze to understand the model, and possibly when understanding the model, we can go back to applications. 
but then actually we go we can go also to pure mathematics so we look at the model we create abstractions we create some abstract objects and we analyze them and at certain stage we can actually move around this cycle when actually we don't have in some sense to be fed from outside but we can answer the questions arising inside the mathematics but quite often actually we suddenly jump back to nature and let me give you the simple example of number theory believe or not but number theory started as applied mathematics because ancient Greeks believed that universe is essentially based on numbers one, two, three, so for example, Pythagoras or Pythag Pythagorean school considered that number one represents the origin of all things, number two represented matter and so on. Okay, so study of numbers, study of ratios were central to uh, applied mathematics to understanding of the world. But then, for example, it changed and the giant of 20th century number theory, uh, Hardy, uh, said that I have never done anything useful talking about number theory. Number theory was considered to be the queen or king of pure mathematics. But then a few years later, actually, uh, it became a basis, one minute, okay? It became a basis of, uh, of, of uh, crypto, crypto systems, okay? So let, let me quickly then jump, uh, and this is very important that we, Closer, okay. It's very important that talking about mathematics and applications of mathematics, we don't distinguish between pure and applied mathematics. Mostly, and this is actually a mistake, to expect immediate returns from mathematics. For example, complex numbers invented in 1544 by Cardano were considered to be rather useless. And it took about 300 years to become cornerstone of mathematics in 19th century and later. Quaternions, an extension of complex numbers, were developed out of sheer curiosity by Hamilton. He simply wanted to see whether they are multidimensional concepts similar to complex numbers, and now actually they are used in video games and tracking satellites. And the last slide here is the number of patents uh, a number of patents actually using the concept of pure mathematics maybe 100 years, 200 years after they had been invented. So for example, sorry, I thought uh, quaternions, for example, were patented, the use of quaternions were patented actually uh, to, uh, con for the construction of a toothbrush because quaternions are very good actually to describe certain sort of like multidimensional circular motions and so on. I see that actually my time is up, so thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, we can't beat the other group uh, because Prof. Yasek probably did something very interesting which nobody could do. So, so yeah, it, it, had to take the, it had to take him to do that. So, yeah, thank you so much for setting the stage. We can't compete. <laughs> But so, so my name is uh, Sibusiso Moyo. I'm, I'm currently the uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation, and Postgraduate Studies at Stellenbosch University. Um, and um, so I will talk a little bit, introduce my colleagues who are going to just say a little bit about what we want to do. Because it's a pitch, usually the pitch should not take more than five minutes. 
Um, so my area of research is in differential equations um, and uh, usually using uh, uh, symmetry methods um, and group theoretic methods to find transformations and solutions to those equations generally. generally. And those equations, of course, come from um, most physical systems. You can model most physical systems using differential equations. But for today, uh, I should start by congratulating, of course, Ulrich and the Ames team for the 20th anniversary, and of course, the CEO OE Mass for the 10th year anniversary. And um, of course, then also acknowledging our DSI partners who are here. I don't know if they're still in the team uh, for being here. Thank you so much. And then also the colleagues from Senegal, Rwanda, Ghana, South Africa, and other countries that are represented. And of course, our distinguished professors um, and emerging researchers who are here as well. So for this session, we're looking at African women in mathematics and the role of representation in mass in terms of research and ed education. Uh, that's the theme that we're given. And then, um, uh, but I just want to add, to also add to this theme that even though it's talking about women, so you are encouraged to come to our session because I believe that it's, it's just broader than women and it's also broader than gender. Gender representation, as you know, it's not just having women, enough women or enough men, but also thinking about people living with disabilities, um, early childhood development and inclusivity in general. Um, how many of you have seen panels where you rarely see, you see a panel, but that panel may be all women or sometimes all men, uh, which in some sense also means that we are not including people in different ideas. If you look at groups that have produced um, the top knowledge in many of these fields where we have a high impact research, you see that those teams tend to be quite diverse in representation. So it's not just talking about race, uh, gender, it's broader than that. And then also understanding um, how we translate our solutions, the problems we work on, and understanding the impact of what we do. I did hear the first group of colleagues who spoke about uh, not understanding the application of the area that they work in. I want to argue that all mathematics actually has applications. And when you think of uh, just the presentation now, I think to think about where it came from, why we do what we do. There is an application in everything we do, no matter how pure we think that is. Um, then I want to maybe also quote a quotation here which talks about uh, the one thing we want to drive, obviously, is excellence. And excellence and representativity does not mean that we compromise on excellence. Uh, for those of you who've read the book by Jim Collins, I just want to quote. It talks about um, good being the enemy of great. And what he says is that good is the enemy of great, and that, and that is one of the key reasons why we have so little um, things that become great, because we believe that we are good. We don't have good schools, for example, principally, uh, we don't have great schools, for example, principally because we have good schools and we're happy that they are good. We also don't have great government. Uh, sorry to the DSI, please don't quote me on this one. We don't have great government, principally because we have good government. But what he talks about is just being content with being good and how things are, are, are and our our, our push there is trying to say that, you know, we should be better than, um, try to aim for excellence and better than what we are, have. So also interdisciplinarity is important. So I want to introduce my colleagues. So in this group, we have a topologist, we have a graph theorist, and then you have myself, of course, whom I'll call, I'm both pure and applied because I need both fields in order to do what we do. So subject depth and versus volume in curriculum is also an issue. I think we teach a lot about everything, but not really going to depth in terms of what we do. So Serene, can you raise your hand? Serene over there, give her a clap, is a topologist. She's a topologist from UKZN, and she aspires to become the next professor, full professor, and, and um, also to occupy a leadership role, which will probably be more than being a vice chancellor, maybe the president of the country one day. <laughs> so we look forward to that. And then there's Rihanna, Rihanna Ru from uh, Stellenbosch. Give her a hand as well. So Rihanna is a graph theorist. So she, she's interested, of course, in building a research community just like um, uh, Serene is. Uh, you heard about her earlier talk in the morning about networks. And she wants to be happy in the future, while Serene will be stressed about her leadership role. And um, she also aspires to mentor others. So can I hand over Serene, who's starting first? Thank you. Remember, we have five minutes. I took some of your time.
Uh, I'll keep it short. Um, so through our session today, we want to be able to debate, converse about representation and inclus inclusivity um, in mathematics and statistical sciences. But in doing this, one has to think about what is the pipeline um, that one has to generate, and what is the capacity that one has to generate to uh, push through the pipeline. And we will do this by first taking into consideration what we have done already, what has worked, what needs to be improved, and what new solutions need to be implemented in future. So at the start of the pipeline, the question arises is, what are we doing to motivate girls to pursue careers in maths and science? And so we have already started with some initiatives addressing this, uh, this particular question, in particular um, STEM Mentor, which started in 2022. Um, you would see quite a few familiar faces in, in those photos um, because this program exists because of the support of all of the women in mathematics and statistical sciences already. For example, Mambuso is up there, Dr. Ronaldo Benjamin, and, and so many more. Um, this program um, started at UJ in 2022 and now runs, uh, as of this year, at UJ WITS. Um, UCT, Stellenbosch University, uh, UKZN, and in June will launch at Northwest University through the support of all of the amazing people in the photos, as well as the COE Mass, NITEX, and other um, funders. So once we have these girls enter the pipeline and enter the university um, sector, what are we now going to do to help promote mathematics and science and statistical sciences to female postgraduate students and beyond. Furthermore, how are we encouraging women in mathematics? So there's also been a number of initiatives that have been taking place um, collectively, but also through individual um, responses. We have a picture above, and that is of a summer school that took place last year at Stellenbosch University. Um, and this was uh, co-chaired by Prof uh, Moyo, as well as Professor Abdul Kara. And here, one of the key things was about ensuring that we had female representation attending this summer school on symmetries of uh, differential equations and difference equations. Ah. On the picture on your left, um, you will see a photo of a, um, this was actually the unveiling of some really beautiful posters at the mathematics department at Stellenbosch University. Um, they were translated into three different languages, and essentially the idea of this was to um, trace the roots of women's or female contributions to mathematics and statistical sciences throughout history. Uh, you will see Prof. Moyo, uh, Dr. Rihanna, and myself also in that photo. This was on, I think, 12th of May last year at Stellenbosch University, where we were commemorating the International Day of Women in Mathematics. The picture on your right is actually a screenshot of our first newly formed council for the division of women in mathematics at the South African Mathematical Society something that was only approved as recent as 2022, and therefore we had the ball rolling on some initiatives and projects last year. So these are the things we want to talk about. Um, what have we done and what do we want to do? I'm now gonna hand over to Rihanna, and uh, she's gonna talk, tell you more about some of the questions that we could address. <laughs> Thank you, Serene. So we don't only want to talk about the things that the Women's Society in South Africa has been doing. We want to talk about issues um, that you have, that you think other people have, and want to work towards solutions. So we want to see where you come from, what can you add to these questions. So I want to add to you one. He says this was just his perspective. Now this is just our musings, and then we can chat about it together and see if we can change the way we think about maths and uh, representation in maths. 
So one of the things that we might discuss would be what is necessary to support women in mathematics research. So um, we saw last year, I think it was last year at Samsung, or maybe the year before that, um, you said something that really struck me. It was that we should not just be just be there to encourage one another to be great. We should think about what we really need and what physical things we can do to make it better for not just women, but uh, in terms of research progress in South Africa. Then um, uh, from a more personal point of view, to see what, what is it that's standing in your way. And this is just not like Serene said, it's not only for women in mathematics. What is standing in your way as someone coming into South Africa um, to be good in research? Great, sorry, great, to be great in research in mathematics. So uh, let's talk about what are those hurdles and how can we get rid of them. Then um, this is something that we in our focus group has been thinking about for a while now. How do we help universities from historical disadvantaged institutions to grow as well? So how do we get those isolate, isolated universities, and someone spoke about this morning as well, Bruce. Um, how do we pick up people struggling in, uh, on their own on an island somewhere in the Northern Cape? How do we get them <laughs> to be part of this? So this is just a broad overview of the things that we would like to discuss, and we would love you to join us. Thank you.